Scholars believe that some of the earliest card games known to humans didn't contain suits such as hearts or diamonds or even numbers. Instead, the cards contained role play, scenarios, and of course, <laughs> drinking instructions. Let's explore the implications of using scenarios and role plays in card games for learning in this episode of the unofficial, unauthorized history of learning games. Some scholars have proposed that around 960 AD, the first card games appeared in China, but other scholars believe it was a bit later. While no one is exactly certain of the date of the very first card game, scholars have discovered a card game that existed in the mid-Song period in China, where paper cards were indeed used in an interesting manner. Here's a brief description of how the game was played, courtesy of playing card scholar Andrew Lau. On one card was written the words, Examiner in Charge of Presenting Scholars. On a second card was written, Imperial Archivist. On a third card, Gentleman Hermit was written, and on the rest of the cards, just the word Scholar. So in this card game, there were three primary roles, and then the rest of the people who were playing had the role of Scholar. Those playing the card game were asked to quietly draw one card each. The person who drew Examiner in Charge of Presenting Scholars does exactly what the title says. He presents the other players to the court, which is the other players, while secretly looking for the gentleman hermit. The person who draws the Imperial Archivist card helps the examiner to look for the player with the card, gentleman hermit, and then present him to the court. If the gentleman hermit is not found among the players after a number of scholars have been presented, the examiner in charge of presenting scholars and the Imperial Archivist both <laughs> have to drink. Cheers. Interestingly, that's one of the simpler rules of the game, which added more roles over time, so they got head of, uh, head of academy and the emissary of appointment, and then they added more and more complicated relationships about who has to drink with who, and all kinds of more rules. In fact, they've even increased the penalty, so, and sometimes you had to drink double. The interesting thing here is that the cards themselves were called leaves, that's one interesting thing, presumably because the shape of the card resembled a leaf, so they called the cards leaves. But those leaves, or cards, didn't have any numbers or suits, only words indicating which role a person was playing. The cards provided a role just as in the modern game, One Night Ultimate Werewolf. In that game, each player takes on the role of a villager or a special character or even a werewolf, and then the other players have to figure out who the werewolves are and kill at least one of them to win. So not as much fun as a drinking game, but uh, safer to play with youngsters. Carrying on this tradition, although in a slightly different way, many card games focused on learning have a similar game dynamic. A player draws a card describing a role such as a salesperson, client, happy customer, or even an unhappy customer, and the player who draws a role play card then must act and behave in a manner consistent with that role. Oftentimes, the card will even contain talking points or instructions or even special abilities of the particular role. Assuming a role because a particular card has been dealt is apparently a concept that goes back thousands of years. Another concept used in modern games for learning that, go back, that goes back thousands of years is the idea of writing a scenario on a playing card and requiring the player who draws the card to read and act out the scenario. Again, going back to ancient China, here's an example of the type of scenario that was found on some playing cards dating back to the Ming Dynasty. Again, playing card scholar Andrew Lowe provides insights into this game. He indicates the game was called Goblet Rules from the Hall of Peace and Elegance. He says the deck contained 119 cards, and they have, uh, some of them are what he called rowdy instructions. So here's one of the cards, card number seven, called The Man from Chi Begs for Leftovers. Here's what the card reads. It says, begging for leftovers is truly despicable. Not satisfied, he goes off elsewhere. His wife and concubine mock him in turn, but happily, he comes home still wanting to brag. 
Then there are instructions for what to do if you get that card. He who gets this order receives an old cup of wine, drinks a little, and then begs for wine and food from the guests. Then he brags. If there are courtesans in the party, they pretend to be his wife and concubine and scold him. If there are no courtesans, his two neighbors act as wife and concubine. So that's an interesting scenario in role play, to say the least. In the game, each card has a scenario which has to be acted out by the players, usually resulting in drinking or some other shenanigans. One of the other shenanigans, closing your eyes and yelling profanities. Probably not the most appropriate activities from a learning perspective, but if, if we ignore the content, the design of the card game with the scenario that has to be acted out, written on the card, and role plays can be an impactful element used for instruction. The value of assigning a role with a card and using card games for learning are important, and they are important for these four reasons. One is easy replayability. With card games, all you need to do is shuffle the cards and different players now have randomized roles or scenarios to act out. The same game can be different every time because different people receive different cards. And if you shuffle the people as well, you know, move them from table to table physically or different virtual rooms, then you'll have a dramatically different game each time. Different people with different roles and different cards. This randomness leads to the desired learning strategy of repeating content, ideas, and instructional material, but without the feeling of, oh no, not this again, oh no, not another repetition, oh no, do we have to go over this again? No, instead, the card game makes it exciting each time. This randomization is not always possible with formulaic, pre-programmed branching video games, and you can do this randomization for both roles and scenarios. Two, because card games are literally over a thousand years old, almost everyone knows how to play. They know what shuffle means, they know what flipping a card means, they know what draw means, they know the nomenclature associated with card games, and they know the basic rules and procedures. There's little cognitive overhead using a card game format for teaching. You don't need to explain what a non-player character is or explain the concept of experience points or in-game inventory management or even how to move an avatar character using the AWSD keys. All you need to do is explain the specific rules for that game rather than the concept of card game in general. In a learning situation where time is precious and you aren't always guaranteed to hold a learner's attention, this pre-knowledge of how to play a card game can be invaluable. Three, social connections. The flowing and open conversation and friendly rivalries that often come from sitting down to play a card game can create new channels of dialogue among coworkers, remove barriers to connecting, and provide a common experience that coworkers can share with a lot less cost and danger than going on a wilderness survival course or a ropes course altogether. Playing a learning card game as a group can help the team build critical thinking skills as well as build relationships. Relationship and team building with card games. Four, these games are easy to design. When designing such a game, it's usually not too difficult to come up with the roles that are involved with a specific job or a task and then brainstorm some relevant scenarios. And often having the players themselves develop short scenarios that can be incorporated into the deck gives them a sense of ownership and the excitement of challenging their coworkers with scenarios that they've encountered on the jobs themselves. And the really good news is that in today's modern world, tools have been created to create scenario-based role-play games with digitized cards, so you don't have to be sitting around the same table or in the same room or even in the same country to play together. As just one example, I am co-founder of a digital card game company that's called Enterprise GameStack, and we've got all kinds of card games that have scenarios on them. And I'm talking about it because I can easily get permission to show you an example since I own part of it. So here you see scenarios on the card. You can listen to the scenario because it can be video-based, it can be text-based, you can read it, or image-based, and then you can drag the cards into the right spaces. Other games allow a group to play together and they can challenge one player or another player's 
answer to the scenario. So it can add some liveliness and some engagement. With Enterprise Game Stack and similar tools, you can easily customize the front and back of the cards, deliver scenarios that are text-based or video-based. You can use QR, QR cards, QR codes. In today's modern world, a digitized card game gives you all the same advantages and some more than physical card games. So card games certainly have come a long way, but the basic elements that drove humans to invent card games are the same elements that make them effective for learning today. So I encourage you to use the lessons learned from ancient card games in your own learning game design. And remember to play, learn, and have fun.